Hey guys, welcome back to Holly Randall Unfiltered. Before I introduce my guest, I want to give a quick shout out to my sponsors, Rex MD, where you can get a low cost generic and branded Viagra incredibly easily. It's prescribed online and delivered right to your door discreetly for as little as $2 a pill. Go to rexmd.com slash Holly today to get started with a sample pack. All right. So my guest today has been in the adult industry for over 20 years, and she has now shifted her focus to making porn a safer space for mental health. After hearing about the uptick in suicides among sex workers, she found out Pineapple Support, the free support and therapy service for anyone who works in the online adult industry. This has been something that the adult industry has needed for an incredibly long time. And so I'm so happy to introduce to you Leah Tannett. Hi, Leah. How are you? I am very good. How are you, Holly? I'm great. I'm so glad that we finally got to make this happen. I know we were supposed to do this interview back in January, and um, somebody got COVID. Wasn't me, wasn't you, but it was somebody <laughs> else who's silently on this on this podcast, Ernie. <laughs> um so now here we are doing it virtually and you're coming, you're all the way in Ibiza, right? Yes. And sadly there are gray skies and, and rain forecast, which is not, which is not how it's supposed to be. This is not why we moved to Ibiza. <laughs> what is the weather like there? I mean, I, I know that it's a place that everybody goes every summer to go party. So I assume in the summer it's, it's warm and amazing, but is it, is it generally like a pretty warm place? Yeah, it's generally, I mean, it's meant to be something like 340 days a year of sunshine. And I mean, in the summer, I would say the weather's quite similar to Florida in that it's humid as hell and really, really hot, except we don't use our air conditioning here because it's it's very expensive. <laughs> so you just sweat it out. Yeah, yeah, sweat it out. <laughs> Which is why you have such glowy skin. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk, let's talk about you. Um, so you've been in the industry for about as long as I have over 20 years. Um, how did you get started in the adult industry? I got started as, um, I mean, I really got started as a dancer. I started stripping at 18. Um, and, and I did that for a few years, but I mean, previous to that, my, <laughs> My Saturday job when I was uh, about 16 at school, 17, was in a BDSM and clubwear store. So hmm. I would go there on Saturday and help help sell and walk around the place in latex and, uh, and be highly intrigued by all the different sex toys and pieces of equipment. And uh, yeah, loved it, loved it, loved the people. Um, as, um, yeah, just a welcoming community. You said that um, growing up, your aunt was a dominatrix. Um, when did you find that out? And how did that inspire you in your career? I actually only found that out um, uh, probably about two, three years ago. So it was after I'd, I'd stopped working um, as an online performer or in, uh, in person um, as a dominatrix and it was my great aunt so it was my grandmother's sister and uh which I just you know I've always said kink is in the blood it's in the blood you're either born with it or you're not born with it it's just it's there and uh and then when I found out that my yeah my great great aunt she used to um lead people around you know on collars and leash while wearing full leather around the family home I was like oh, yeah yeah, yeah, definitely true. <laughs> definitely in the blood. So how did you find that out? Um, her sister, her sister told my mum. So, so my other, my other great aunt um, told, told my mum, and my mum thought it was hilarious, and they had to call me and, and tell me all about it. Uh, I do need to find out more, more details, but haven't been home to see the family in a while. Um, so yeah, and, and I must, I must find out a little bit more. I, I'm assuming you didn't know her. No. Oh, wow. No, no, she'd passed before. Uh, either she'd passed before I, I, I got to know her, or it must have been when I was very young. Right, right. Wow, that's so interesting. So um, tell me about how your career developed from working at that store. 
Uh, it's always been really organic for me, which I, I think is exactly how it should be in the adult industry. Um, I, as I said, from working in the BDSM store when I was 16 and then started dancing when I was 18. Uh, I then stopped dancing, got married, worked in fashion, tried living a vanilla lifestyle. And I always say, absolutely not for me. Um, although my ex-husband is a wonderful, wonderful man. Um, it was not it was not a compatible mix. I was finding myself looking online at latex again and things. Um, so we broke up and recession hit. And uh, obviously working in fashion was very difficult retail. So I decided to open my own retail store. And if people weren't going out, they were staying in. And the retail store was online selling really hardcore BDSM equipment. So I went off to one of the shows in Munich, BoundCon, on my own, just to see what else was being being sold, what was there, to meet people, to let them know about the, the shop. And uh, made some incredible friends um and was asked to do some modeling and then the modeling turned to do you want to do some videos um and then at the same time because I was starting a new company obviously you have no money this is what happens when you start a new business and some of the women that I was meeting at the at the parties were were dominatrix and I was learning how much money they were making and I thought well this is brilliant I like dress dressing up I'm a sadist. This is this is perfect. So was uh, was trained by three different amazing doms, uh, you know, to make sure that she understood all the medical impacts and how to use the equipment properly, how not to damage someone, um, and and there I just moved from there. Then I started from the from the modeling and doing the dominatrix work, to doing online videos. I also ran um, BDSM parties and the city where I came from uh, and that's kind of yeah it all just it all just progressed really naturally met lots of wonderful wonderful people who helped hugely and you know advising on what equipment and making introductions and yeah I think I was just very very fortunate um, and and as I said when it's in the blood I guess you just just flows <laughs> so you already were like predisposed to having that kind of dominant personality. So I would imagine, I mean, you called yourself a sadist. So I would imagine that the transition was probably pretty natural for you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I always really enjoyed the, the kind of sadist part, the dressing up part and the, the, the play. I've never been great at humiliation. Uh, mm. Just feel like that's not me. Um, more of a sensual sadist can we be a sensual sadist i think yeah <laughs> yeah well i mean i think we can all agree that you know people who visit bdsm places you know as submissives take pleasure in the pain that they experience right otherwise they wouldn't do it so i think you could definitely say that so what because i know that you know different dominatrixes have different specialties what would you say was your specific specialty ball busting <laughs> so tell us a little bit more specifically about that and then you also talked about how you were trained you know to not cause like actual serious medical issues so how do does one engage in ball busting and not send somebody to the hospital i will be very honest when i went through my training ball busting was not part of that training it just kind of happened and i realized how much i enjoyed it um and worked with um a particular male who is very well known online and videos are very well watched so once i worked with him and he said that apparently i was the, the best ball buster in all the world and he traveled the world and been kicked many times <laughs> uh, and after that i just had <laughs> so many so many emails but you know the problem is that most of the, I think for a lot of people with, with ball busting, it's a fantasy. That it's, it's, it's not something that they can actually take. So yeah. 
you know, the emails and most of them are, you know, can you castrate me? Can you kick me so hard that I'll never be able to have children? Um, and, and all these things that are just so against uh, morale uh, or my morals uh, that that there were there were very few people that I I, I could work with and um, yeah it's, it's it's an odd it's an odd fetish in that way in that way that um that I think it's something that's fetishized and fantasized about but that the 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 follow through is not as um uh, yeah as they would want or what that they can actually do so it's an interesting one. Yeah, I had a conversation um, a few episodes ago with Tina Horn, actually, and she we talked about cannibalism and the cannibalism fetish, which obviously is something that you cannot follow through with. But, you know, people have this fetish around the idea of being eaten and consumed. So, like, how do you play to that without actually eating somebody? So um, it's interesting, these fetishes, right, because you have to find a way to indulge people without causing irrevocable harm. Um, exactly. but I just, I, I feel like I, I just wanted to get you a mug that says world's best ball buster, because that just feels like, do you not have one of those or a shirt no, or something? <laughs> but I, I think you should really have one. I think, uh, for Christmas that might be, I might, you might get a little gift from me. <laughs> I would love that. Love it. And I'm, and I'm just thinking of like the imagery and the graphics that could be, that could go alongside the text. Oh yeah. I mean, so um, sadly I'm not a graphic designer, so perhaps we might have to collaborate on this. I mean, I don't know, maybe it could be a whole new line of Holly Randall HRU mugs, <laughs> but uh, I just, I don't know. I just thought of that, you know, with Father's Day, Mother's Day coming up like world's best ball buster. <laughs> it's just uh, so good. <laughs> Oh my Talks God. Love it. Yeah. So, so how did all of this segue into you starting pineapple support? I guess let's start with, um, what were the, what were the things that you saw happening in the adult industry that made you feel like there was a need for something like this? I mean, honestly, it was, um, uh, it was quite a shock to me. I'd, I'd taken a little bit of time off performing because uh, my brother was suffering quite severely from depression and anxiety. And my mom asked if it'd be possible if he could come and stay with me in Ibiza because coming and living in Ibiza had calmed me down as, as a teenager and helped me connect more with myself. And, you know, it, it, it's so it's so tranquil here. People know it as a party island, but that that's like too three small areas the rest of the island is about meditation and nature and tranquility and spirituality it's where the original hippies came from you know it's it's really ingrained in in centering and understanding yourself if you allow it to um so he he came across and I took a little bit of time off uh and then when he moved back to the UK or moved out of my house at least Thought, right, I'm going to get back into it and I'm going to go full, full on. So I flew straight across to LA for the Expos Awards. And this was in um, 2017, sorry, 2018, so it was January. Um, and that was just after, you know, we'd lost a number of well-known performers to suicide or, uh, or you know, overdose or, and, and you know, the all mental health related um, reasons. And I remember lining up to get into the award show and people were handing out the suicide ribbons or I think it was bracelets there. And I had a bottle of champagne in my hand, having a wonderful time. So excited to go to my first big award show, not really paying attention to what was going on. Uh, when we got in, I was with uh, Christina Carter, who's one of my, my bestie friends. And we sat down. And then as the show opened, they spoke about the, the lives who the lives we'd lost. Um and I was and I mean I was I was really overcome with you know, I was crying. I was and this was from going one minute 
to giggling with the bottle of champagne and this is so much fun to oh my god I had absolutely no idea because for someone that just dips in and out of the industry you just see the fun parts you just go to the conferences you just see the highs you you're not part of the you're not part of the community mm-hmm. so it was a, a huge shock uh, and then obviously went on to the the AVNs and there there was more and more discussion about suicide and the issues surrounding mental health within the industry uh, and uh, again you I kind of I, it was it was upsetting but you you carry on with with what's going on around because that's why you're there um, and it was on the flight home that I just couldn't couldn't stop thinking why hadn't anyone done anything and I was sat on the on the flight googling um you know mental health in the adult industry you know charity and in, in, in porn non-profits and seeing that there was very little out there there were organizations who were providing mental health resources but the, it wasn't their main focus and although I've been very fortunate in my life not to have suffered greatly from um any any um mental health problems I mean everyone gets a bit of anxiety everyone gets sad but any serious mental health issues uh I have been surrounded by it my grandmother had schizophrenia my mother worked in mental health my my brother suffers I've you know as with a lot of people I've been I've been surrounded by it and lost friends to suicide um so it really it, it just really hit a chord and the fact that with such a big industry that there was nothing out there um it was kind of this well okay I can take some time off work and you know without without an income I can put some money where my mouth is and get this thing started I've got a background in business and a knowledge of the adult industry and no specific affiliation to um any particular company because I think that was very important to be independent um mm. So it was kind of this, well, if I don't do it, clearly nobody else is going to. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was that. That was at the end of January. By February 13th, so it was the day before Valentine's Day, I had come up with the name and a rough idea of how it was actually going to be able to to work. And then we launched on April 7th, I think. Wow. I mean, that's that's fast. It was. It was, But I had this thing in my head. And I mean, it went a very unhealthy thing in my head that kept saying every day that this isn't available someone's going to die every day this isn't available someone might die someone might take their life again and 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 if that happens you know it's not wouldn't could you have saved them could you have helped so that was um that was part of the reason that it happened so quickly the other is that the, the, the way in which I always work is that everything has to be done yesterday so. yeah I know that feeling <laughs> makes me a good producer, but also makes me crazy. So, but you know, we get shit done. Um, all right, guys, we're going to take a quick commercial break and we're going to come back. We're obviously going to talk so much more about pineapple support, about the stigma surrounding mental health and the adult industry, of course, and how Leia is working to dispel both. So hang tight. We'll be right back. Hey guys, if you want to support my show, then you should think about joining my Patreon. At my Patreon, I offer all kinds of amazing perks in exchange for your financial support. From live streams of my interviews as they are happening, to bonus Q&As, behind the scenes photos and videos of my shoots, plus cool merch like stickers, mugs, and hoodies, we have you covered. So go to patreon.com slash hollyrandallunfiltered, and while you're at it, make sure that you click that subscribe button so you don't miss a single one of my new updates. All right, everybody, we are back. So Leah, what was the initial reaction that you got when you started Pineapple Support? The initial reaction was was wonderful, absolutely fantastic. Everyone that uh, I spoke to was incredibly positive. Um, reluctant to give money <laughs> to begin with. But I think, you know, it's understandable. It's understandable with, with any business, which is why, you know, I said before, it, it was important for me to have enough funding to to get it started and, and to be able to at least cover the 
therapy expenses, et cetera, et cetera, for in my mind, a minimum of 12 months, because you need, if you're asking people for big chunks of money, you have to be able to prove what, what you're doing is going to work. Um, right. But everyone was saying, you know, this sounds great. When you get going, let us know. We'd love to support you. It's like, ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, now you have like a big sponsor list, um, Brazzers, Chatterbait, Pornhub, and Playboy. Um, how long did it take for, for you to get like big names like that to sign on and support you? Pornhub were actually our first sponsors, which was, yeah. it, which was amazing. And uh, they came on in the December. Um, and it was it was an absolute game changer because it wasn't just that they had it, was, it wasn't just the money that was hugely needed at the time but also having that name behind you and having that kind of promotion and then going up to other companies and saying porn up sponsor us yeah it was uh, it made it made all the difference and it just it snowballed from there which was um yeah it, re it really was incredible and i'm very grateful to them for for making the bold move and being the, the first people to, to back us there. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, full disclosure, I work for mind geek. They're the only company that I work for mind geek, uh, Pornhub is owned by mind geek. Um, but I will say that they are one of the few companies and I've worked with everybody, um, that really like gets behind causes and supports them financially. Um, and, uh, you know, so that doesn't surprise me at all. And that's, that's incredible, but, um, yeah, not surprising. So they're, they're so great about that. I remember when the pandemic first started, um, they actually came to me and this, and at the time I was shooting for other clients as well. They weren't my only client and they came to me and they gave me like a lump sum of money to give to my crew for, because nobody had any work. And so I sent them like kind of a, summary of like my crew and who worked my crew and what they made. And they like gave me a bunch of money to give to them to help get them through the pandemic and no other company did that. So just saying. No, I've, I've, um, I have a little love for mind geek as controversial yeah. as that can be to, to a few folks, but, uh, they've been, they've been so supportive through a number of the, the companies that they, they own. So. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, what was, uh, where does the rest of your financial support come from? Um, and how does payment work for patients who are seeking therapy? So um, all of our funding comes from sponsorships, whether that be the companies who sponsor us or individuals, we have a, um, a membership scheme, which is pineapples United. And um, with that, it's a small, uh, you make a donation each month starts at $10 a month. And it means that you can come and join us every quarter with myself and some of the other board members and actually really talk about what's happening in pineapple, what's happening in the industry and what, what we could be doing that's better because at the end of the day, you know, we, we need the feedback from the people who are actually performing, who are creating content. Uh, so, so that's, that's, um, that's been a really great, uh, initiative, but, but yeah, all, all of our, all of our funding comes from donations and sponsorships. Um, and when it comes to payment for therapy, the workshops, support groups, webinars, uh, the in-person wellness retreat, everything that we do, uh, other than the one-on-one -on -one therapy is completely free. When it comes to the one-on-one -on -one therapy, it's on a pay what you can basis. So when you apply for therapy, there is a little box that says, how much can you afford per session? And sometimes that, you know, if that's zero, that's zero, but paying for therapy is part of therapy. Mm -hmm. It's, um, we did, we did quite a bit of research, obviously when, when choosing how to set this, set the model up. Um, and of course, you know, every dollar that somebody else can, contribute towards their therapy means that we have an extra dollar to pay for for somebody else who can't who can't afford that much so it's it's um it's beneficial in 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 that way as well but as if people put a don't put a value on things that are free 
So if something's offered for nothing, a lot of the time people just won't turn up for their therapy session, for example. Uh, whereas even if somebody is contributing $3 because that's what they can afford, then it means something. And it's what it's what they're contributing to their own mental health. They're contributing to to their growth, and that's a really really important part of um, of the process. That's interesting. That makes so much sense, though. Um, my therapist is very expensive, <laughs> and I I don't see her every week. Uh, at this point now, I actually only see her like when I need to. Before I used to see her regularly when I was really struggling with my sobriety. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can betcha I'm, I show up and I'm on time. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, for some folks, you know, they, they, they can afford the, the maximum we'll pay any of our therapists is a hundred dollars an hour. And some of our therapists mm-hmm. would ordinarily charge, you know, two fifty, three fifty. They're, they're top therapists, but they offer us a reduced rate because they want to support the adult industry. So mm-hmm. there are a number of performers that come to us for therapy and they pay the full 100 Mm -hmm. they come through us because they can't find a therapist who is industry friendly and doesn't stigmatize them for their work yeah I was I was that was leading me to my next question is you know when I have spoken to a lot of sex workers struggling with mental health um, they've talked about you know facing issues with therapists who you know, chalked up all of their issues to the fact that they're in the adult industry. Like, oh, well, that's, that's why you're having these problems is because of the industry that you work in. So how did you source therapists who didn't have that kind of bias? So originally at the very beginning, the, I sourced therapists because they were my friends. So (laughs) I knew they were cool with the, with me, what I did. Um, and then just um to, i just googled sex worker friendly therapists and started calling people and started emailing people and then googled sex positive therapists and emailed them and kink aware therapists and emailed them and every single every single therapist that works with pineapple support and uh, we have about 300 usually around 200 working at at any one time but uh depending on people who are on holiday or taking a break. But we have about 300 registered, and I have personally interviewed every single one of them uh, to just to hear, hear their thoughts, just hear their experiences, and, 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 and just get a feel for, for who they are as people. And we have a huge variety, which is amazing, because, you know, one, one size doesn't fit all, particularly with therapy. Mm-hmm. So... It's it's really great to have so many different styles and different people and different personalities. Uh, yeah, we're, we're we're so fortunate to have such incredible people working with us. And now we don't yeah, have I mean, to hunt for them anymore. They all come to us. <laughs> that's amazing. That's that's kind of the, one of the things about therapy that I learned when I was you know trying to fight the right therapist. And I've been through a lot of therapists. Is that not every therapist is the right one for you? So I find that you know, when I have friends who are struggling with mental health, they'll go see one person and they won't vibe with that person. They don't like them for whatever reason. They'll be like, see, therapy doesn't work. I'm like, well, you know, therapists are humans and everybody has a different style and you connect differently with different people. So if that person doesn't work for you, you have to find the next one. I mean, I remember specifically when I was, you know, like I mentioned before, struggling with my sobriety, I went and saw one therapist who actually suggested to me that perhaps I wasn't an alcoholic and it was like something else. And I just, I'd had enough experience with my alcoholism. I had had a large chunk of sobriety and then I relapsed to know that like, that was an incredibly dangerous thing to say to me because I was looking, you know, naturally I would be looking for somebody to give me permission to go back out and and drink again and tell me that I could moderate it and I could control it when I had proved to myself over and over and over again that I could not do that. And I just remember feeling like what an incredibly irresponsible thing for that person to say. And of course I sought somebody new out, but I also thought to myself, well, if I was somebody who was like new in my journey and I, you know, 
didn't recognize that this person didn't understand addiction, um, how that could have had kind of disastrous consequences. So um, that's great that you have such a wide variety of people. How how does it like how does it work for you if if I'm going into Pineapple Support and I want to find a therapist? Are there like categories of different therapists? Like how do, how does one or do you just automatically get matched up with somebody based on like specific preferences? Yeah, so basically we um we match people with a therapist depending on their location and the areas in which they need support. There is also a little kind of um notes box if somebody would like for example a you know a BIPOC therapist or a female therapist or um they they can put in a special request or someone that special that specializes in EMDR or a specific type of therapy. So so that is an option. Um so this, so that that that's how we will match somebody with a therapist initially. Um if the person doesn't gel with that therapist, then they can let us know and we can try and find somebody else that uh, is in their area and has the same areas of expertise. Um, that can, that, that's when we come across issues like that there could be a slight waiting list because, for example, you know, in, 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 in some of the more random states, I'm going to say, uh, we might only have one or two therapists and there could only be one that specializes as in eating disorders, for example. Mm. So if the person that's matched with that therapist doesn't gel with that therapist, then we do have to either refer them out, try and find some more resources or see, ask if they're okay to wait while we, we go um, hunting for therapists. Mm -hmm. What do you find are the most common issues that sex workers are facing when they turn to pineapple support? Since the pandemic, almost everyone that comes to us uh, has has marked down anxiety as as a problem that I you know that's one of the uh, effects of of the pandemic. I think we've all we've all experienced anxiety because of the pandemic. Um, we have quite a few folks who've experienced trauma um, and there's been quite a change. We used to have a lot coming to us with personality disorders. We no longer have so many coming through with with that it 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 all it kind of it seems to ebb and flow in in different in different areas and then again in different states. You know, as you can imagine, in Nevada, we have a lot of folks that come to us with substance abuse problems. Um, and the, yeah, it depends on the demographic. It's actually really interesting when when we take a look at the um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for um, when we get the statistics when we when we do, when we run the reports on uh, on the application forms. Uh, but but I would say depression, anxiety, and trauma are are the top three. Right. Um, have you seen the stigma of the adult industry affecting patients? As far as I am concerned, stigma is the only reason that pineapple support exists. Stigma is the main cause of uh, mental health issues within the adult industry. If, if you know, you you imagine. If you imagine the impact from society due to stigma, due to projected shame that's projected onto onto sex workers that you hear from maybe your family, from your let's say friends, um, and from the general public that what you're doing is shameful. You hear it over and over again. You then suffer with you know maybe small depression or or or, or something happens and you try to teach to talk to people and they tell you it's because you work in the adult industry. You then go to a therapist and that therapist confirms everything that society has just said to you. This is a professional mm. that's, that's now agreeing with, with what, um, what's his face that lives across the road and the, the mother of the, the kid at school and everything else, you know, this is just, going to send somebody on a huge huge spiral 
Mm -hmm. you know it's um it's just it's disgraceful really it's been it's, it's incredibly upsetting but but yeah without without the influence of stigma there would be no need for pineapple support people would have access to any therapist that they could um get care from through their uh insurance they'd be able to get insurance at uh an affordable reasonable rate um mm -hmm. but you know it, it's there, w there wouldn't be so many problems around money, around banking, around housing, around every single basic aspect of life. Because we are sex workers, we are stigmatized. And it is because of that, the pineapple support exists. What do you say to people who would then argue, well, of course, sex work stigmatized because it's a lowly profession and you should get out and do something else with your life. And then you will no longer face that stigma. You mean after I've throat punched them? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, at least then they won't be able to respond as you come back with your, uh, <laughs> True. Oh, no, I actually had uh, a conversation really recently with, with a friend of mine who, who was saying, well, you know, it's like any, celebrity you're putting yourself out there to be to be judged and what you're doing is even more vulnerable so you know you you bring it on yourself um and to a point you know there, there is that you're putting yourself at you as a public figure you're putting yourself out there to receive feedback from the public but the difference is that the public don't give the same amount of respect to an adult performer as they would to say a footballer that did bad on the pitch that day or um, a mainstream actor uh it's it's a profession that people many people don't understand that sex workers choose to be sex workers because they really like being sex workers um and i think trying to politely educate people um on the fact that as i said people really enjoy their job they do this job because it can it can be a great income if you do it correctly it's an amazing community most folks get into the industry because because as i said they, they, they love it be that cam work be that porn be that you know um bdsm or fetish side they do it because they love it and if you are doing a job that you love, that other people are taking pleasure from, why on earth should that subject you to criticism and, and shame projection? Yeah. No, I mean, I, I absolutely agree. And that's like one of my favorite arguments to get in <laughs> with people. So I totally understand the throat punch thing. The other thing that also makes me crazy, and you see this, you know, so a lot of times we'll see you know, these, because I, I see this all the time, people say, oh, you know, the adult industry is terrible. Look at the suicides and um, the deaths of all of these porn stars. And, and a lot of them are actually after the people have left the industry and they've been out of the industry for a while. And so therein, I would argue again, like how this, it's the stigma that is the problem. Um, the way that society treats people who are in the adult industry or were in the adult industry. Um, a great example. And I think her name was Nicole. I've got to get this down. Um, she was, she was in the adult industry for a very short period of time. She left and decided to go into nursing and, um, she got essentially pushed out of her school because her teacher found out that she had been in the adult industry and essentially stigmatized her for it and like push her out of school and she sued the school and I believe she won. And for me, that's just a wonderful example of this whole, like, okay, well, you know, get a real job. You hear that all the time, right? Like you're just a whore, get a real job. Well, some people do leave the adult industry and go out and try to get a real job. And then they can't even have that real job because they once worked in the adult industry. I mean, another example, if you listen to John Ronson's The Butterfly Effect, um, he interviewed a few performers who had moved on and got fired from their jobs because they used to be in the adult industry. Dale DeBone, he was a nurse. He was fired from his job 
at the hospital, I believe, because they found out that he used to be a porn star. Um, so it's just crazy, you know, these, yeah. this decision that you make follows you for the rest of your life. And the adult industry is not the right place for everybody. I think we can all agree upon that. You know, it's, it's not the right job for everyone, but it's the perfect job for some people. So it is, but I think a lot of people recently, um, because the pandemic have been getting into just following on from Mm -hmm. that. Sorry, I I jumped in there. Um, But there are so many folks who are now doing, um, or or who started doing cam performing, particularly during uh, uh, COVID, or launch and OnlyFans, not reading the small print, not thinking about the long term effects of of becoming part of the adult industry, and now it's there. It's there forever. You don't you don't even own the content. You know the the fan sites own the content. Um, it it can always be there to pop up at any moment. Um, and the adult industry for for me has been the best industry. I, I'm, I would never work in any other industry. But as you said. It's not for everybody, and I think there have been a lot of folks recently who've who've entered into the industry and possibly not thought through the the long term the long term effect. Right. Um, yeah, absolutely. But my hope is that eventually, at some point, there these long term effects won't exist. Like, why should you be punished for deciding to work in an industry? Maybe, you know, maybe you were young and you made a decision and it wasn't for you and you want to move on and become something else. Like you shouldn't be barred from being able to pursue a different career because you once were a cam girl or you once did a a handful of porn scenes. It's just like, it's just crazy to me, you know, Mm -hmm. um, that, that for me is the most infuriating thing is that, you know, people can't move on with their lives. So, um, is there... (laughs) Is there anything that fans can do or not do to support their favorite performer's mental health? Um, I'm going to say, first of all, they can donate to Pineapple Support at pineapplesupport.org and hit donate. That would be fantastic. Uh, Another thing fans can do to help support um, their favorite performers is not to send shitty messages or post shitty comments. Um... (laughs) This is this is something that is so rife, and I was actually I was just at the Grabbies Europe, which is uh, the Gay Porn Awards in in uh, in in Europe. It was held in Spain. I was talking to a a young performer, uh, a young content creator, and he was saying that he lost his Twitter account and started a new one in the last three months, and said that the the difference. And the amount of abuse that he's receiving on a daily basis is is unreal. Um, just just in the last the last few months, and you think, why? Why? Just just get on with your day. If you don't like what someone's doing, or you thought their haircut looked better before, or they've put a bit of weight on, haven't we all? It's been COVID, and everyone likes a cake um like just just chill out keep if you can't say anything nice don't say a thing at all (laughs) yeah yeah but i mean of course we see this you know with social media and the internet because people feel like nobody ever has to be personally responsible for what they say right if they hide behind a screen name so they can say whatever they want and you know the things that people say to you are more indicative of what they're going through than having anything to do with you at all. And it's, it's also funny to me too, is, you know, these, these negative comments that you see on Instagram and on Twitter, like specifically those platforms, unlike TikTok and YouTube, which are much more rife with terrible comments, but for understandable reasons, because of the way the algorithm works. So with Twitter and Instagram, for the most part, you have to follow somebody to see their photos and what they're doing. I think there's suggestions for you sometimes, but it's not, it's, it's not all that much. It's maybe a couple of accounts and you generally have to be following someone in that industry to get referred to those accounts. So like people are literally like seeking these people out. Obviously they know who they are just so they can say horrible things to them. 
And it's like, if you hate porn and you think it's terrible, like, why are you on a porn person? Just don't watch it. Account? Just don't, watch just, don't it. just go like follow home and gardens, you know, and learn how to like plant your vegetable patch this year. Like that, yeah, that's available to you. <laughs> that's available to you. Oh. Now, TikTok and YouTube, they push people's, um, pieces of content out to the general public. And so that's why the comments on YouTube and TikTok can be so much worse because they can actually get pushed to people who aren't specifically looking for that type of content. And then it pops up on their feed and they feel a need to say something. Not that they should, but you know, but yeah, especially specifically with Twitter and Instagram, I'm always like, but you literally like yeah. you really just, don't just, have to be just here. Chill out. And the, the other thing I would say, um, if you're not being mean, <laughs> is respect content creators boundaries mm. if someone says no if someone says they don't want to ask a, answer a question if someone is being polite to you if someone's telling you that they're busy and maybe they can't get back to you for a little while respect that it's one person with sometimes hundreds of thousands of fans and people messaging them on a daily basis it's it as it's You've, everyone everyone only has so much bandwidth and spending 24 hours a day on social media answering fans questions is really bad for your mental health mm -hmm. so if you consider yourself a fan of a content creator be patient please respect their boundaries don't push people and and know that that you are respected and you are appreciated because that's where the money comes from that's where the love comes from that's why we're the people who are are out there making content and making money they're there because of you the fans so just be a little bit more chill yeah yeah i can definitely cap to that um so my last question for you is how do you take care of your own mental health um well, about two weeks ago, I hit burnout and was able to get from my bed to the sofa uh, for about 48 hours. So I'm going to say that I'm working on it, like all of us are, <laughs> trying to, for me, what works best is routine, getting up early, going to the gym, taking the dogs for a walk, and, and really, really structuring my days. When that doesn't happen, that's when it can go awry, like it has done recently. Um, and and I think something that um, we all need to remember, myself included, obviously, is that when this does happen, to try and be kind to yourself. Because when, when you hit burnout or when you hit a point where your mental health is just low and you, you can't function properly, the, I think your automatic kind of self-dialogue kind of goes to, Oh, for God's sake, pick yourself up. You're, well, you're better than this. You've got work to do. You're going to let people down. And as I said, you can't, you can't pour from an empty cup. So mm. it's that, that self, and that includes the self dialogue, be kind to yourself and try and look after yourself and, and try and keep the balance, which as I said, is, is a continual learning process. And um, yeah, I think something that we all need to focus on. <laughs> Yeah. And if you know how to do it, please email me, let me know, tell me all about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. That's, I mean, it's just the journey of being a human being, I think. So, yeah. Well, Leia, thank you so much for coming on. This has been so great. I'm so glad that we finally got to connect. I've been wanting to do this interview for such a long time. And, um, I just want you to know that, you know, the industry, um, really appreciates you and your efforts and, it's a wonderful thing that you're doing and I hope that it continues to grow and thrive with, of course, the support from generous donations like yours, dear listeners. So go to pineapplesupport.org and please donate. Leah, where else can people um, find you or more information on Pineapple Support on social media mm -hmm. or where else? Uh, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter, uh, pineappleysw and on facebook which is facebook.com slash pineapple dot your safe word and and then also the website which you just mentioned which is pineapple support.org fantastic 
And you guys can find me at Holly Randall on Twitter and on Instagram. Also, don't forget, I am on TikTok at Holly Randall Unfiltered. And make sure that you subscribe to my YouTube channel if you have not already. That's uh, youtube.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. And last but not least, if you want to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered. And of course, one more shout out to Pineapple Support for all the incredible work that they are doing to the, for the industry, um, pineapplesupport.org. Please donate. It would be much appreciated. Thank you guys so much for watching or listening wherever you are, and we'll see you next week.